Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips, tricks and time management related to this examination. In this tutorial, we'll be continuing with chapter 4 of set C and shall be looking forward to understand more relative questions from the chapter 4 to understand the better tips and tricks to tackle some of the remaining concepts which we have not covered so far and we shall be looking forward to understand how to tackle them better as a part of this tutorial. So let's move on and next question we have for you is question number 25. Question number 25 says, uh, how can white box testing be useful in support of black box testing? I would like to remind you one thing. I was just talking to someone uh, recently and that person said that there are some important things in ISTQB. And I said, how is that even possible? Because a question can be asked from anywhere in the syllabus. Every single line is important. So how can we even you know, talk about having a list of important topics which someone can prepare? And that does not make sense. So please not be under that intuition that you need something important to remember in order to pass this examination. The whole syllabus, every single line, in fact, every single word with their terminologies are important to crack this examination. This question is one of those examples which is coming from a small topic that how white box testing can be beneficial in other ways. That means applying the best technique and what are the benefits and uh, advantages of having white box test technique being conducted. It was a subtopic in 4.2, I think 4.3, which is white box test technique. Uh, so after statement testing, branch testing, there was a subtopic applying white box test technique. And you can't imagine that this question is drafted from there. So let's exactly see what are we talking about. So we are talking about what is the relationship between white box and black box testing techniques. Let's look at the options here. Option A says white box coverage measures can help testers evaluate black box test in terms of code coverage achieved by the black box test. I think this to a certain extent based on our understanding we went through the syllabus we remember that uh, yeah it is one of the possibility because uh, performing only the black box uh, testing does not provide the actual measure of the code. I would like to recall and remind you once again here uh, that we covered already in the tutorial that it, it is not necessary that uh, black box testing which is driven by the specification and happens on the front end of the application is capable enough to hit every single corner of the code. And that's where white box testing plays a vital role because white box, test, white box testing is code driven rather than specification. Our test cases are more about the code coverage and we try to hit every single line of the code and we also understand what is really not required, we eliminate them. But black box testing from UI may not have all the capability or I would say not 100% capability of hitting and executing every single line of code which is written. And this is pretty much practical. So that is where we say that a blend of white box and black box, white box and black box both are required in order to achieve the best coverage possible because white cannot actually test what is not implemented and that's the drawback of it. Black box cannot hit every single line of the code as far as you have a test for it. So that's where we can say that this particular option A makes a particular sense that white box coverage measures can help testers evaluate black box test because uh, when it comes to white box coverage, it measures uh, the measures provide an uh, objective measurement of coverage. And uh, in case the black box test uh, cases uh, are not hitting that particular part of the code, uh, using this particular code coverage, uh, we can go ahead and uh, create those additional test cases and add more value to our black box testing. So yes, it certainly has this kind of relationship that the uh, white box testing techniques can help us to determine what test cases can be missing in the black box. Now, there's a different thing which we can talk about when we say, um, if we are doing white box, then why should I do black box, right? Now, that's not the point. It's more about uh, performing at the front end like a user preferences, user perception. And second is certainly about the, the code coverage. Let's go to option B. Option B says uh, white box coverage analysis can help testers identify unreachable fragment of source code. 
Now, uh, white box uh, coverage can help you reach unreachable code. That's pretty much making a good statement. It's a valid statement because uh, unreachable codes which cannot be executed by black box, white box testing can pretty much cover that. But the point is, this option or this particular statement has nothing to do with the question being asked to us because the question is about what is the relationship between white box and black box. And in option B, we are just talking about what is white box. Okay, so this option has nothing to do with what we are asking you. Let's go to option C and option C clearly says here, uh, branch testing subsumes a black box test techniques. So achieving full branch coverage guarantees achieving full coverage of any black box test technique. I think uh, that's another interesting statement to be getting confused with because we had a line in white box testing which said that 100% branch testing guarantees 100% statement coverage, but not vice versa. But that relationship is between statement and branch coverage, not between white box and black box. So yes, and second important thing, subsumes. Subsumes is more of like, in simple words, like subset. So here we are saying that branch testing is uh, kind of like having black box test techniques as a subset. So if you have conducted branch testing on any particular application, then you don't have to apply black box test technique. And you don't need me to tell you that that's not true, right? It's not a subset of branch testing. Black box testing has its own set of significances and values to be added when testing a simple application. Let's move on to the option D. Option D says white box test technique can provide code coverage items for the black box techniques. Uh, th that's again uh, something which is uh, uh, okay uh, because uh, when we talk about uh, deriving test cases uh, from the white box test techniques, that's not something what we generally do. But when we look at this statement here, it says white box techniques can provide coverage items for the black box test techniques because uh, number one, it cannot, okay? It can only help you understand what we have tested, what you need to test. That's the type of relationship we have, which we covered in the option A. Because white box test techniques are completely driven by the code, the basis of that is code, and black box test techniques are driven by the specification requirements. So how can one can support the other in terms of giving the test object or things like, hey, this is what is the reference and you can use as far as the basis is same, we can make that statement, but as the basis are different, we cannot make that statement. And that makes it very clear that the right answer to this particular question is, A, that is white box coverage measures can help testers evaluate uh, black box tests in terms of the code coverage achieved by these black box tests, which simply means that we may be evaluating our um, capabilities of the test in terms of how many tests we, we have created, how many more to do, and at any point, if you realize that your test cases are missing something, you can add more value. Let's move on to the next question. The next question we have for you is question number 26, and this question is talking about, consider the following list, correct input not accepted, incorrect input accepted, wrong output format, and division by zero. Okay, so in one word, we are just talking about the common uh, things which go wrong with the application. So what test technique is most probably used by the tester who uses this list when performing testing? Again, I think we can go start uh, with the basis discussion that uh, the black box test technique make use of uh, uh, specification and this does not look like a specification. White box test techniques makes use of uh, code as a basis. This again does not look like a code for sure. And the third category is experience-based test technique, which certainly makes use of uh, the past experience, domain knowledge, and knowledge of typical defects. So this third point, that is knowledge of typical defects, plays a vital role in experience-based testing because that becomes our basis to test and try out those areas which may have the problems. And yes, it looks like one of the experience-based test technique, but which one? Let's check, check, check the options out here. The option A says, uh, exploratory, B says fault attack, C says checklist based testing, D says boundary value analysis. Very interesting, very, very, very typical type of trick being used. Uh, instead of saying error guessing, they give you the keyword fault attack. The only reason to do that is not many of us would remember this keyword which we covered inside error guessing. And all of us would remember generally error guessing, checklist based testing and exploratory testing as three techniques under experience based. So it's very easy to ignore this keyword, 
right? If you have been uh, a little bit uh, easy on the preparation, you would not know that false attack is other name for error guessing. So two important things, exploratory uh, uses test charter, checklist based testing uses checklist, boundary value analysis is not and uh, will not be basically a part of that. So part of that in the sense, because it's a black box test technique, it's not an experience based test technique. So D is anyways rolled out. And if I talk about uh, the right answer, so out of the three, the right answer for this particular question is B, false attack, because I just justified to you, exploratory testing makes use of test charters and checklist uses a set of questions to be answered while evaluating them. Whereas only the false attack is the approach which uses the list of common faults, that is common defects, which we may experience as a part of our preparation. So let's move on to the next question. That is question number 27. And here we are talking about which of the following best describes how using checklist based testing can result in increased coverage. Uh, two important things, checklist based testing, we should understand what exactly it is. So it's basically more of like using a questionnaire, which is very high level. And at the same time, uh, this requires experience of the tester to be utilized in order to test it. And uh, talking about increased coverage, it certainly gives us the wide open range to perform any kind of actual data while executing the test. Uh, sorry, expected data while executing the test that gives us the freedom to try multiple scenarios with limited time uh, without following any kind of form formal test cases or steps. And uh, thus on, on an overall thing, we can say that uh, checklist can really result into increased coverage by being more uh, asystematic rather than being systematic. But uh, right here, that's very important to understand that the way I'm doing, uh, you know, kind of solving the questions here are very important to be understood. Just don't listen to the justifications, the tips and tricks. Uh, every single thing I do in these videos are a part of the tips and tricks. Every time I read a question, I first recall while saying to you that what exactly is the context of it? What do we remember from the syllabus before looking at the option? Don't ignore that pattern because that is the pattern of solving the examination. You need to really look forward to recall. What do you know about it? Try to bring back all that into your mind and then look at the options. So every single question you would have seen that I sometime get to the context, recall it, discuss with you, then go to the option. Sometime I say that, hey, the context is not clear. There's nothing to recall. You just have to read the option to get to the right answer. So try to judge those questions where you need to recall, where you don't have to, or where it is not possible, how exactly options can be read, uh, what kind of detail you need, and everything else what is important. So just follow every simple thing what we are discussing here. Every single thing is going to contribute to your success, not just the discussion of the right answer. Okay, so let's look at the options here. Option A says, Checklist items can be defined at a sufficiently low level of detail. I think this is the point where you can cut it off because uh, checklist is an experience based test technique and does not use low level of detail. It's always high level. And to further continue, it says so the tester can implement and execute detailed test cases based on these items, which makes it completely invalid because in checklist based testing, we do not use detailed test cases. In fact, the tests are not created at low level. These are all high level uh, questionnaire or things to be checked, items to be checked, which are not at low level details. Let's move on to the next option. B says checklist can be automated. Again, that's the point where you can hold on, but still to complete. So each time an automated test execution covers the checklist item, it results in additional coverage. Number one, uh, automating high level test cases are very critical, uh, very difficult. I'm so sorry, not critical, very difficult. The reason is the steps are missing. We don't know the detailed steps of it. But when it comes to automation, an automation tools uh, tool needs every single step what a user would do in order to perform an activity. Like clicking on this button, selecting a drop-down value, entering a name, phone number, etc. Every single step has to be done in order to click on submit button or continue button. So it's not that a high-level test, which is one-liner, can help you automate things. So we don't automate high-level test cases. In fact, it is possible to do, but you need someone to assist you with all the detailed steps. So that's not what we are talking about. The second part here is also saying that uh, the automation can result in additional coverage. Uh, no matter how many times you run a test, the test will give you the same coverage, right? Because your repeatability is increased, not 
the coverage. So both the sides, that's the wrong statement. Option C says uh, each checklist item should be tested separately and independently. So the elements cover different areas of software. That pretty much makes sense. That's a very, very valid statement. Every time you write test case, the only objective you have in your mind is one test is different from another. In other words, all we are trying to say is you avoid duplicate test cases so that you don't waste your effort. Yeah, that's very much true for the checklist based testing as well. But how would this talk about increasing the test coverage? Okay, because in checklist, I may certainly write 20 questions, but that 20 questions have a fixed coverage, what I am measuring in the product. But writing additional test case would make more sense. Yeah, I know some of you may think that, yeah, that makes sense, right? If you're writing unique test cases that increase the coverage. No, no, no. I'm talking from that point of view that if I've written 20 test cases to achieve 80% coverage, then these 80 test cases are separate and independent. But that does not mean increase 100% coverage, right? Writing additional test cases, if you said in that option, that would make more sense. So additional test cases would increase the coverage, not just writing independent test cases. Okay, and option D here says uh, two testers designing and executing tests based on the same high level checklist items will typically perform the testing in slightly different ways. Exactly true. If you remember our initial recallation discussion had that like the freedom, what you get in experience based testing, the test cases are written on high level and we are free to change any kind of data in terms of expected result and run the test depending on our own thought process and perception. So yes, if a test, high level test is given to two different testers, it will be completely a distinct approach to execute them and it will not remain the same. And that is where I can increase the coverage. So I can distribute this checklist to multiple testers and ask them to run it. Given that there are only high level statements, the team will have their own approach of trying out the different scenarios, different test data, and they would have better coverage achieved. So this would make more sense compared to the all three. So putting up all together, the right answer for this particular question is D, that is two testers designing and executing tests based on the same high level checklist items will typically perform the testing in slightly different ways. And by doing so, we can increase the coverage by using checklist based testing. So always remember that is the question about checklist, is the question about a technique, is the question about coverage. So context is to be very supposed to be very clear because if you miss the context, you even can pick option C as the right answer, which is not correct. So paying attention to every single word is critically important to come to the right answer. Otherwise, that's the reason most of the people come back and tell me that I failed, but I don't know why I failed. I thought these are all the right answers. I don't know where I went wrong. And if I just tell them that you missed something in the examination, Sometimes it's difficult for people to accept that, no, I, I paid attention to everything because you don't remember you forgot that. Because if you would have read it, then you remember it. What you didn't read, you will never remember it. So how can you say that you read the question carefully? See, trust me, the only reason for the failure is missing something. So don't take that, right? So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.